I'm back in plenary session, real life edition. I'm joined by Dr. John Ioannidis. John, it's a pleasure to see you again. The pleasure is mine, Vinay. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for allowing me to interview the third time, I think, that you've been on this podcast. Um, so much has happened since we last spoke. Uh, but first, I should introduce you to the audience. Of course, you're a professor at the Stanford University, and uh, you're a specialist in meta-research, and meta-research is booming these days. Um, and uh, of course, we're going to talk about, I think, COVID-19 policy, as well as maybe a little bit of meta-research or some new updates. I wonder if we could start by talking about the new variant, uh, Omicron. Uh, how do you pronounce it? You, you know okay. better than me. Yeah, it's, a, it's another Greek word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Omicron indeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, I think that uh, what we know changes every day. Uh, so by the time that you show this video, probably things have changed uh -huh. and uh, I will seem like a complete fool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to post this video today, actually. Okay. So hopefully I'll keep even, it timely. Even, even that then. might be too late. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so clearly, you know, it's one of these circumstances during the pandemic where the landscape of evidence is uh, shifting sand and mm. uh, things change very rapidly. But what we know at the moment is that it's already pretty widely spread in terms of the number of countries that have detected it. The countries that have not detected it, I bet probably many of them are just not doing enough uh, mm -hmm. sequencing, enough testing to, to be able to see that they already have uh, Omicron mm -hmm. within their borders, right. although some probably do not, but, but I think most already do. Um, there is some evidence that it's uh, easily transmissible, probably more easily transmissible than Delta. But Delta is a good champion. Uh, it's an excellent champion, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in that regard. So it's a little difficult to beat Delta. Uh, and if it does, probably it will not be that big margin that we saw when Delta was introduced compared to previous variants. I see. The big question is how lethal it is. Uh, it's not a good thing to be easy to transmit because then you expect more people to be infected. But the, the key issue is how lethal it is and what do vaccines do for us. Uh, if vaccines cover it pretty well, which so far, as of this hour and this minute, mm -hmm. <laughs> it seems that they do, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not perfectly, but so far I haven't seen any devastating evidence to the contrary. And if it's not lethal, which again, as of this minute, it doesn't seem to be that lethal, we seem to have good outcomes, I don't think it's a reason to panic. I, I think it's just one more variant. If it is more transmissible, it will become dominant. If it's far more transmissible, we will see that. If it doesn't, it will just remain a minority or it may even go away in the, the big picture of things. Hmm. That's a, a good perspective. What are your thoughts on, you know, anytime there's a new variant, the first thing I see companies do and laboratories do is try to figure out prior vaccination, what does it do in terms of neutralizing antibodies against this variant? But of course, that is a surrogate against the thing we care about, which is, for somebody who's vaccinated, will this variant cause severe disease? How do you think about that surrogacy? Do you trust that as a surrogate? Is it a good first pass surrogate or do you want to see the clinical data? Surrogates have a, a reason to exist. Uh, they have been with us uh, for decades, way beyond uh, before the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, so I don't want to discard them, but we also know over many decades that surrogates are surrogates and they're often very misleading. Uh, we've been misled in many different fields of medicine over the years. I think that the surrogates we have for vaccine effectiveness, it's early to say uh, how good they are because uh, you really need to have very solid clinical data and long-term follow-up with uh, long-term effectiveness in the population to be able to mm -hmm. tell what you learned from the surrogates and what it told you downstream uh, for one or multiple vaccines. So uh, people need to do this work because it's handy, it's easy to do, you can get it done very quickly and we need to have some evidence right away but really the proof in in the putting is is really what we do at, at the clinical level because what what we care about is saving lives vaccines do save lives i think they have saved a lot of lives um, but i cannot promise that the surrogates that we're testing will be good enough to tell us about what will happen with a different variant like omicron with the next variant who knows what greek letter we will have in mind at right. that time yeah, no, I think that's well put. I mean, the evidence I have in favor of surrogacy, it's really sort of a mistake to call it surrogacy. It was really a correlation between, you know, in the initial set of uh, vaccines, the rate with which they were able to generate neutralizing antibodies had a correlation with the vaccine efficacy against symptomatic disease. But one cannot conclude from that data that 10 months post-vaccination, 
15 months post-vaccination, the setting of a new variant, what that antibody and protection against severe disease relationship might be. It might I, be very I, different. I fully agree. And I, I worry that the more tests become available, I mean, some of these surrogates become available in the market. You know, right. people can get themselves tested for different types of antibodies and get some weird results of levels and try to interpret them. And try and to I'm, boost as a result. Of right. course. Yeah. And, and then I'm sure that uh, we will have other types of immunity testing like T-cell immunity probably coming right. yeah. downstream to become a market <laughs> commodity, uh, even though it's more difficult to perform in large scale. And from the very beginning, uh, as you recall, one of the key reasons I, I was attacked in the early days was that I performed an antibody study. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and I, I was insisting yeah. even then yeah. that this is just a tool for epidemiology, for a survey at the epidemiological population level, not to be used for clinical decision making by any means. And I, I want to stand firm mm -hmm. in that position even more now, because I think that lots of people are looking at these surrogates as if they're going to tell us what will happen to them and whether they should decide about what to do with their vaccination status, get boosters, when, how, and, and so forth. It, I think it's very dangerous to, to use them um, at a clinical level. It, if not dangerous, at, at, at least it can be misleading. Pe people can get very wrong impressions about what they mean. Hmm. That's well put. Your thoughts on, you know, it seems bizarre to me that even years later after the initial uh, COVID uh, concern, um, that in response to a variant, we instituted travel bans. Many nations around the world instituted travel bans. As you point out, that the moment we had identified the variant, it very likely was already in many places. And thus the travel ban, I think the equation for the travel ban, the potential upside is to marginally change the seed load in a nation by preventing a few more cases, but acknowledging that you already have a lot of cases on your soil. So you marginally change the seed load versus the downside of massive socio-political disruption, disruption of the lives of people. How do you think about travel bans? Do they have any role going forward? I, I'm very skeptical of travel bans. I, th I think that they do have a role under special circumstances. Uh, if you have something that uh, is clearly very dangerous and is clearly limited to a particular geographic location and you know that your country or your area is still virgin to that variant. I see. And I think to, to some extent the success, if one would call it a success in terms of containing the spread of COVID-19 for Australia and for New Zealand, you know, island countries, uh, might have been to to a good extent due to travel bans, mm -hmm. uh, because I mean these countries uh, they have very sealed borders in in contrast to the U.S. Uh, and in contrast to practically all European countries that do not. Um, so it, there are circumstances probably that if you have a very steep gradient of a variant that is very plentiful in one location mm -hmm. and you have none of it, and you impose a travel ban, maybe you can gain something. But in, in the current circumstances where practically every country around the world has tons of COVID-19 cases and most of them have still some active epidemic waves, and I bet probably Omicron is already spread even in Australia, right. um, let alone all European countries and the US, many states, you know, the states that have not detected it yet probably have not tested enough. I, I, I think that it's going to be very difficult to justify uh, especially prolonging travel bans, right. uh, unless we, we do see that this is really a very special variant that is very lethal mm -hmm. and our vaccines do not work and we need to do our best to contain it until we get Omicron specific vaccines. Uh, and of course, companies are working on them, but I, I, I don't see that so far. Uh, right. So uh, people want to be prudent, but I, I think that much like other measures, we should always balance what they can achieve versus what they mean in terms of harm, in terms of disruption, in terms of destroying people's lives. Uh, and some of the measures can really be very, very disruptive. Hmm. I think we've seen that throughout the pandemic. I wonder if I might ask you to your thoughts on, um, let's talk for a minute about vaccination. You wrote a very, very nice article about um, how, how you think through vaccinating children. And I think it, it didn't proscribe the answer ultimately. It was really just sort of a framework. How do you think about it? And I think I'll try to say some of the points that resonated with me. One point you made is that um, it will be very difficult to know what effect the vaccine will have on mortality, particularly in healthy five to 11 year olds, because as we've seen now in a preprint from Germany, there are essentially no deaths in the whole country among kids who don't have comorbidities. I've seen some people on Twitter say that, um, you know, it's, um, uh, it's discriminatory to treat uh, children with 
disabilities or comorbid conditions differently than healthy children when it comes to vaccine policies. But to me, I feel like it's always been part of medicine to use the vaccine, perhaps in the type one diabetic eight year old who is vulnerable, preferentially over the five year old who is normal weight and not as vulnerable, use that first. I mean, that's just good medicine. Um, so your, one of your points was that the deaths are so low in this group that you'd have to run a trial of like, I don't know, 7 million people or something to even be able to see a death signal uh, and you're not able to do that. And in the absence of that, um, your points are, we have to think about the pros and cons about the things we can measure. And then the other thing I want you to comment on a little bit is your thoughts on one of the things people say as a justification to aggressively vaccinate the very young is that it may benefit the 85 year old who's already gotten vaccinated there may be some marginal benefit to this 85 year old but one of your points was that that's really rather speculatory and we just don't have evidence in either direction what that means so i wonder if you might talk about that how do you think about vaccinating kids and effects on older people so clearly this is a hotly debated uh, topic and i want to start with uh, the statement that i'm very much in favor of vaccines i think that they have made a, a huge difference uh, I would never tell someone who wants to get vaccinated not to get vaccinated. I, I get uh, lots of very nasty comments from anti-vaxxers and uh, uh, I, I, I get death threats from different types of people, but I think that, that <laughs> from all are, over the place. these are particularly <laughs> yeah. worrisome. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that you know we should not uh, create a feeling of uncertainty to people who are struggling to decide on whether they want to be mm. vaccinated. Uh, but this being said, I think when we're moving to the younger age groups, uh, indeed, the, the risks are very, very, very low. Uh, both the risks from the vaccine, they're extremely low probably, mm -hmm. uh, and also the, the risks from uh, coronavirus itself. I even worry that the microscope of epidemiology, as we know it, especially the type of epidemiology studies that we can do and that we can have available, mostly including surveillance, mostly passive surveillance, uh, uh, mostly observational epidemiology, do not have the discriminating ability to, to give us clarity when you get to risks of, you know, death rate of uh, two or three in a million, mm -hmm. uh, or even for some uh, side effects like myocarditis, uh, 50, 60, 70, 100 per million. Uh, because if there is a, a problem with reporting, and we know that there is a problem with reporting in any type of passive surveillance, you don't know whether you need to multiply that by two or by five or by 10 or by 50, depending on, right. on what the toxicity is. So I, I think we should provide that information to parents. Uh, we should give a consistent message that we don't really see any death signal from vaccines and something that is devastating, because I think that there's a lot of literature or actually not a lot of literature, but a lot of people who claim that they see signals and I, I don't really see them mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of, of toxicity, um, but I'm very eager to continue searching and continue collecting information and, and let them decide. You know, don't make it compulsory. Don't, don't make it uh, something that they have to comply. Otherwise, they will be punished uh, and they will lose their jobs or, or they will suffer uh, mm -hmm. somehow mm -hmm. in one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, but present information and tell them that this is what we know, this is what the benefit might look like, this is what the risk might look like, this is the amount of uncertainty that, that we have. And of course, once you enter the clinical dimension into consideration, like the examples that you mentioned, that modifies substantially at least the, the benefit right. uh, equation, because we, we're talking about multipliers of two times or three times or more for each kind of comorbid condition that you have. So you have diabetes and you have heart problems, you have cancer, you have immunodeficiency, uh, you have other conditions that would, uh, obesity, I mean, mm -hmm. a major right. one, that would multiply the risk from the disease and therefore also the potential benefit from getting vaccinated. I, I think all of that should be transparent. It should not lead to debates and to battles and to smearing and to uh, death threats. <laughs> it right. should just be there for people to know, uh, not be forced to decide. That's well put. Um, I'm going to come to that, uh, the compulsion in a second, but I want to ask you a question about the vaccine. Uh, when I watched the Vaccine Advisory Committee, 
I found that of the many lines of argument, the thing that I found most persuasive was a model that was presented by the FDA, and they modeled seven scenarios. And the seven scenarios said, let's assume different base rates of SARS-CoV-2 spread. Let's assume different rates of hospitalization among young kids. Um, those rates benchmarked to what had, we had seen with earlier strains of the virus and earlier time periods, but be that as it may. Let's assume that there will be an adverse event signal. We don't know for 5 to 11 precisely. We, in fact, don't know at all, even to this date, um, because we've not seen any events, thank goodness. At least none have been reported. Um, but let's assume that the rates are the same as in 12 to 15 year olds using Optum healthcare data. And so they made this model saying, let's assume the same rate of myocarditis is 12 to 15 year olds, but it's going to get this much benefit, this many fewer hospitalizations. And they weighed that seven scenarios. They also ran a randomized control trial and the randomized control trial was a few thousand kids. But interestingly to me, the randomized control trial, although it showed a uh, non-inferior geometric mean titer antibody against historical benchmark with other ages, which was the primary endpoint of this study, the, not, the trial was just too small to see a reduction in hospitalizations, deaths. It didn't note a reduction in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2, but many of those symptoms may be quite mild, leading to a test. Not a real rock-solid clinical endpoint. The point I want to raise with you and see what your thoughts are is that it's interesting to me the regulatory decision because we waited for the trial to be done and then we made the decision, but all of the model that really pushed for the decision, all those inputs were known before the study. So I feel like it's a catch-22. Either you approve the vaccine earlier based on the model, you could have done it four, three months ago, or you run a randomized trial large enough that you actually get better clarity on these on these point metric on these point uh, on these on these components to the model. But what you've done is you run a randomized trial that's just too small to give you any new information, and you waited for that to make your regulatory decision. So actually, I think people should be kind of frustrated by this. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? As you know, I have argued from the very beginning that we need randomized trials yeah. on important questions, and uh, the the fact that. Uh, things are urgent does not mean that we need to wait for them. We can still uh, act, but try to get the randomized evidence as quickly as possible while we're making some preliminary decisions. And that applies also to vaccines, especially as you get to vaccines to kind of debated territory. Um, now, here we have a randomized trial, so it's better than nothing. <laughs> yeah. But in, in a way, that randomized trial is so small that it looks more like a ritual. That, yes. uh, that you know, regulators like randomized trials. It's like a prayer. Uh, so you need to make that prayer first. But right. that's not really a randomized trial that is informative. I, I agree with you that we would need randomized trials that would be much larger. Uh, one would say that would be too expensive. Oh, goodness, you know, these companies have made uh, hundreds of billions of dollars probably. Right, yeah, no, they have. So, so, Pfizer reports $30 billion this year. Uh, yeah. Indeed. So I, I think that uh, running some rigorous, large-scale randomized trials, uh, also ensuring that these randomized trials would have long-term follow-up, right. regardless of whether you do with licensing. I, I'm fine to get things licensed in the current environment. Everyone can be licensed, even <laughs> for for drugs that are completely ineffective. So, you know, a vaccine that can save lives, goodness, it's like a top priority. I right. haven't seen that for, for ages. Yeah. Most drugs are, <laughs> yeah. Don't are work just nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that um, we need more of them. We, we need better, larger, longer-term follow-up randomized trials to complement our information from observational data and mm -hmm. from modeling Modeling is modeling. I don't want to dismiss it. I do modeling myself. I get mm -hmm. it wrong all the time, I bet. <laughs> but um, I think that it, it has lots of limitations and it has lots of uncertainties that you need to speculate on. The biggest uncertainty is what this virus will decide to do. Right. <laughs> if, if you have a non-active epidemic wave, then you know the best solution is just do nothing. <laughs> mm. So if, if the virus decides to go away, which I don't think it will, but uh, if you have something that is very close to, to that scenario versus if you have a very active epidemic wave where everybody's infected or reinfected mm -hmm. and who knows with what kind of severity under infection. So the, the modeling has to do so much speculation and so many assumptions that you kind of end up concluding what you thought before you did the modeling. Right. I, I, I think that Talking from a meta-research angle, we need to rethink about how we do modeling, about who does modeling, about how we try to encompass some sort of pre-registration perhaps, or some sort of independent auditing and review, some sort of, of balancing options, because otherwise modeling in the COVID-19 era has shown that it's a self-fulfilling it, it, prophecy. It's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it can give you whatever result you want, especially with complex data and with data that are incomplete, that are having lots of problems and, and lots of uh, spaces that you need to fill in with your assumptions. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. And um, 
I think, uh, I mean, that's going to be one of the biggest challenges going forward is modeling in an environment where more and more scientists are also activists. And to some degree, um, I mean, that's not always a bad thing. Of course, activism is good and it's led to many important changes. But the more scientists view themselves as activists, the more they feel partisan. Um, models, we'll see two sets of models. We'll see models for each political party supporting whatever their preordained conclusions are, and that's problematic. Los Angeles County right now, you know, you've talked about, I think, a good, sensible middle ground, which is inform people of what we know and don't know about vaccines and let people make the choice that's right for them, particularly for their children. I think that's always the sensible strategy. LA County has just announced uh, 34,000 children are not meeting their mandate, and their mandate is for 12 and above under the EUA, you have to get two doses, and I think the cutoff is January 1st, and there are 34,000 kids that are about to be expelled from school. These are kids who have already been without school for over a year because LA was notoriously closed longer than other places. Um, it's Even under racial lines, it's not all the same. My understanding is that 90% of Asian Americans are, are vaccinated, um, it's 87% whites, it's 60-some percent blacks. Um, so it will have a racial dimension to the kids who are being excluded. Um, I guess what I find, I'm curious what your thoughts are about the policy, and also I'm curious about the paradox I see, which is that Los Angeles prides itself as being a progressive institution championing the underserved and disadvantaged, and I think to some degree they believe this policy is doing that, but I think the result may be actually to disadvantage greater the most disadvantaged people in society who have already lost the most. I wonder your thoughts on this. This is a major problem that has been with us throughout the <clears throat> pandemic. The pandemic hit disadvantaged groups more than the privileged. Uh, I was sheltering at home, uh, working on my computer, uh, and uh, people had to be out there working uh, as essential workers for me to, to have a nice life. And I, I think that we have seen that at all dimensions. We have seen that dimensions of workplace, education, schools. Measures that were used hit also the disadvantaged more than, than other people. And many people just lost more of their ground uh, compared to the, the average citizen. And it is these people now who are attacked again by different measures. And it's not just uh, LA County. I, th I think it's, uh, it's something that I see happening all over the world. I, I talk with colleagues from many different countries in Europe, all over the world, and it's, it's a common theme. The, the people who were hit the most still continue to be hit the most. And people who have remained unvaccinated they tend to be such that we're hit most already. And of course, they are the most vulnerable because they're unvaccinated. So they're more susceptible to having severe disease. And on top of that, instead of helping those who are more susceptible and more disadvantaged, we're saying we're going to punish you. You know, we're going to make you lose your job. We're going to make you lose your education. We may make you starve eventually. I mean, many of these kids uh, are in the borderland of, uh, of having a social existence, mm -hmm. in a sense. So I, I really worry a lot about that. In, in my view of public health, public health should help everyone, but should help even more those who are disadvantaged. I, I, I may be wrong about it, but I, I have a sense that public health should also be an instrument to try to correct some of the inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, that is due to various reasons. I mean, in the US we have uh, racism, we have other forces that create tremendous inequality that gets perpetuated. In other countries, there's other reasons, but eventually we do get a lot of inequality mm -hmm. and a lot of disadvantaged people around. And public health, for me, should do its best to help these people, not to, 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 to make them even more marginalized, not to, to make them suffer, not, not to make them uh, feel that their life is more difficult because what, of what the authorities do. The, the authorities should try to to do something that would make their life better, not more difficult. I, I see many politicians in Europe now that they go out in the news and when they're asked by, uh, you know, news anchors, they say, uh, say, you know, how are you going to increase the vaccination rate in your country? They, they reply, oh, don't worry, we're making these people's lives difficult. Mm, uh, and right. they're, they're proud about it. Their, their, their pride is that they make people's lives difficult. And I, I, I'm, I'm just feeling completely stunned about seeing this as a goal for for a leader or for public health even more. I find it, I mean, I think, I, I agree with you that they say that. And I think that they, sal I mean, people relish the fact that they're doing that and people are open about it. that's what we ought to do. I think 
if I were to put myself in their mindset, they rationalize it by thinking that by doing that, I'm contributing to a net health benefit in this world. I'm doing good. But I think what they have trouble visualizing is a few things. One, um, it is possible that you increase very marginally the Delta vaccine rate by very draconian measures. I mean, if you drag people out on the street and beat them, I mean, you're going to get a few percentage points. You know, you, you, can, you, know, you can keep cranking and, up the and pressure. And that happens already. And that happens right, you know, for other reasons, right. But you can, yeah, you can, you can, you can get it higher. Um, I suspect like job, you know, if you look at the universe of people in America, these mandates typically hit working class people 18 to, you know, 60 some years old. You're not really hitting the 85 year olds who are unvaccinated, who have not yet seen COVID, who are the most vulnerable. You're missing those people and you don't really have a good way to leverage them because they're really, they're retirees. They're out of your control. You know, they're living off their savings. Um, you're hitting one group of people, may not be the group you want to hit, and you may increase it a few percentage points, but there'll be downstream negative consequences, which is a fraction of them will be pushed out of the workforce or the, the school force. Um, they will, their lives will be pushed to the corners of society. They won't be able to come into movie theaters or restaurants. Um, what they do instead in their free time will affect you. If they all gather together and have parties and thwart you, they can spread SARS-CoV-2 and brew their own variant if they were to be coordinated. And then the other thing you're doing, I think, is you're creating political animosity towards um, your future. And politics is a long game. You know, you want to do good for people this year, but you need to do good for them 10 years from now and 20 years from now. And if you poison your political future, you'll never be there in 20 years. They're going to hold this against you forever. And I feel like the politicians are not taking into account those factors. I agree that there is um, some some sort of uh, a disconnect between the short-term goals and the long-term goals. Mm -hmm. And as you say, some of the aggressive mandates and measures that make people's lives difficult uh, will achieve some short-term gains. I, I have no doubt about that. If, mm -hmm. if you're forced to do something, you will do it. But deep in your heart, you will feel some resentment. And I think that it's that resentment and it's that negativity and that sense that public health is failing me. Public mm -hmm. health is not doing something for me. It's it's trying to suppress me. It's trying to destroy me. It's trying to to marginalize me. I, I think that it creates a, a schism within society. It, it creates separated groups of people uh, who hate each other, uh, who hate authorities, who hate politicians, who hate uh physicians who hate scientists, who hate science eventually. And I, I think that this is the least that, that we want at the moment. Uh, it, it creates, unfortunately, a loan that will be very hard to pay downstream. I, I think much of that has to do with our inability to separate politics from science mm -hmm. during the pandemic. It, it has been a huge mess. Um, politics you're happy if you can get 50% of the population to agree with it. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can get elected even with, with a less. bit less. <laughs> yeah. um, if you get 50%, 50.1%, that's, that's amazing. But then, uh, you know, 49% uh, is angry with you, is infuriated with you. In a polarized environment, uh, they're crazy <laughs> against you. In science and in, in public health, that political success would be a complete disaster mm. because you have that 49%, which doesn't need to be 49%. It could be 30%. It could be 20%. It's a huge number of people who lose their trust of, of science, of public health, of, of what you're telling them that is best for them. You know, they, they, they feel that you're cheating mm -hmm. them. I'm telling them get vaccinated and they say, you know, John probably is bought by who knows Pfizer or, mm -hmm. <laughs> or he, he belongs to that party, which sometimes is a right wing or other times the left wing. Depends on the country. Depending on the country yeah. that I speak. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sometimes I belong to different parts of the spectrum even though I don't belong anywhere. Um, and, and they just put you in, in that bin and then they decide that no matter what happens, you're their enemy and science is their enemy and they need to fight science because it's suppressing them. That's, that's the, the most horrible recipe. I think that countries that have done best are those where politicians just moved away from from the scene or you know tried to be as quiet as possible mm -hmm. of course you know they, they will always debate in the parliament and uh, in congress and houses but um, they just tried to move away from the public health communication and messaging and you just have public health people who everybody understands that they have nothing to do with right or left or, or middle or 
you know, Republican or Democrats or, or whatever you have in, in different countries, trying to do the communication and uh, trying to convey the message that I do care about all of you. I'm not trying to create separate groups of people. I'm not trying to create uh, citizens of rank one and mm -hmm. citizens of a lower rank. I'm, I'm just interested in all of you. And we have a common problem. Uh, let's try to solve it together. And we are all in the same boat. If it sinks, all of the, all of us will drown. You know, some mm -hmm. of us probably will drown first, but eventually all of us will drown. Right. Uh, and and you mentioned the example. I mean, all all the marginalized people they lose trust to all interventions eventually, and they will do things that will probably make the magnitude of the epidemic wave worse compared to what we would have achieved otherwise. We've we've seen that with masks. We've seen that with vaccines. We've seen that with Anything that got politicized, getting things politicized, I think, is, is the, the worst thing that can be done in the current circumstances. Hydroxychloroquine, as you mentioned. Hydroxychloroquine, you know. yeah. It's, it's, it's and, a horrible uh, story. Ivermectin. Yeah, uh, same thing. Yeah, as, as you know, you know, my team published that meta-analysis yeah. showing that hydroxychloroquine increases the risk of mortality. Yeah. Um, but I, I can still talk to, to Didier Raoul and you know, tell him that I think that he's wrong about that, but we're not going to kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about, you know, I mean, I want to ask you about um, one of the things you're saying is that um, the countries that did well, I'm curious if you would if you tell me which ones they were that uh, it, it, it politicized it. And so that's one question. Who do you think did well, or at least in terms of the policy? And I do think that it's it would be easy for you to say something like New Zealand did well, but I think, of course, they have natural advantages. Who did well because of their, their, act, because of their choices, um, either in mitigating the pandemic or mitigating the damage from the interventions? And then my follow-up question is, I think just a, maybe a comment. Uh, in the United States, if you look on television or you look at the public health experts um, who are in the government, I know the political party of everybody. I think <laughs> Scott Gottlieb is a Republican. He's the only one of the only one Republicans that they ever put on TV. Um, the most are Democrats, and they're either been appointed by a Democratic president, their known Democratic allegiance on Twitter, their pandemic, their feed is a mix of open political advocacy and public health measures, and I think they. They don't see what they're doing, but they are in fact politicizing it by making yourself um, constantly supporting candidates you like and saying what the public health messaging are. You're creating packages in the minds of the audience. I can't. I, I struggle to think of anyone who goes on TV regularly who I, I just say, "Hmm, I wonder who they voted for." You know, I always know. Thoughts on that? I, I have great respect for people regardless of, of their political background and allegiance. And uh, I, I'm not going to judge an expert based on whether he will tweet or say in some uh, news uh, that uh, here's what I think, which kind of points to being Republican or being a Democrat. I, I think that there, you know, we have a democracy and this, this means that people should believe and vote for whatever party they want. But I think that tying experts to political parties it does create that high risk environment mm -hmm. that that people then become believers and and they they just get attached to their political inclinations and they decide uh, whether to do something or not based on what their party is going to tell them and in, in public health that's not what we want we uh, we want something that will be cohesive for the entire society it will be good for everyone and it's not going to be because democrats say so or because republicans say so I, I think that this has done a lot of damage. And at the end of the day, it's not an issue of convincing people who have the same political ideology as, as we do. That, that's not what public health is about. It's about convincing everyone, including those who think differently about mm -hmm. different issues in terms of being progressive or, or, or conservative. And uh, understanding that this is an opportunity to really solidify our society and, and the cohesiveness of our society. Mm -hmm. uh, our country has gone a lot of divisiveness, but I see that in many other countries around the world. It's not an American characteristic. Uh, it's a sad characteristic, but it's not American. I think that uh, one of the consequences that I feared the most when the pandemic started, and I wrote that in my very early pieces, was that I don't want us to end up in this type of intense situation with, with riots, with animosity, with with perhaps wars. and we see all of that mm -hmm. in different parts of the world. I think that's that uh, many of the things that uh, that you had alluded to in that original writing I see are coming more and more true by the day and I think more people will see that with time. I want to talk to you about Bangladesh cluster randomized control trial. 
Uh, you know, of course, they're the two major randomized controlled trials on masking. I wish there were more, of course, and I know you do too. Uh, we have Dan Mask. Uh, Dan Mask, of course, was powered for a 50% reduction in individual acquisition of SARS-CoV-2 um, from receipt of a box of surgical mask and instruction to wear surgical masks in Denmark over a period of time in the summer of 2020. Um, many people faulted Dan Mask because it, they thought it was underpowered. It was powered for a big difference, 50% reduction, which we think is implausible. Maybe the, realistically, we're thinking 10 to 15% reduction. It just didn't have the power for that. I mean, it's just too small for that. Um, but then simultaneously, some of the people who used to say it was underpowered, now I see them on TV saying that masks have an 80% or 90% risk reduction. And I say, well, you know, if you believed it's 90%, then, you know, it turned out Dan Mask was adequately powered. But, you know, so you can't have it both ways. Okay. But Dan Mask, of course, was negative. The Bangladesh randomized control trial is a positive study with, uh, you know, 11% relative risk reduction in acquisition of SARS-CoV-2 in mask villages versus non-mask villages. Um, the primary endpoint was symptomatic seroprevalence. You have to have symptoms that triggered the seroprevalence test. Um, now the data has been shared. And through data sharing, something very interesting has emerged. I don't know if you've seen this yet. Um, what is interesting is that they paired villages and they randomized the villages. And then they performed the initial consent uh, visit. And in the villages that were the control arm, um, it, uh, they consented uh, something like 100,000 people. In the villages in the intervention arm, that were balanced for a number of characteristics, they consented 15,000 more people, 115,000. There's an imbalance. And people have speculated why that imbalance exists, but one potential reason is that was an unblinded consent. So that the people consenting, um, maybe they drove up in a big truck with boxes in the back, <laughs> full of free masks, you know. But the, people, the villagers knew that they were gonna get something for free. And the people consenting knew they were gonna give them a mask, and they may have been more inclined to consent them. So although randomized, this is, a, I think, a key bias, which is that you're consenting some people on the margin who wouldn't have consented if you weren't going to give them anything, but they are going to consent if you do give them something. Then they go forward and they find, you know, a certain amount of symptoms are reported. And then among people who gave blood after symptoms, which is, you know, every step of this, they lose people. But among the some 4,000 people in both arms that gave blood, the rate of testing seropositive is exactly the same. It's like 23.04, 23.24%. It's the same rate of seropositivity. But the denominator they're using in one is 15%, it's 15,000 bigger than the other, which gives them the statistically significant finding on the cusp of significance, by the way. So some people point out that, which is, which is the answer? Is the answer that the mask worked 11%? Or is the answer that you consented more people who are on the margin and those are not the kind of people who are going to report symptoms where they'd have symptoms at all. And it's not really a, 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 an, unba an unbiased randomized trial. So I wonder your thoughts on this and your thoughts on this very controversial No, no trial is, is perfect. And I think that the, the Bangladesh study was a heroic effort. It was done by amazing scientists. I know some of them. Uh, some of them are at Stanford, actually. Uh -huh. I have great respect for them. And I think that it was an important study, and I, I wish we had more of them. Right. I, I wish we had more also of the of the Danish uh, study. Uh, instead of having these two, I would like to have 10 or even 20 because it's, it's a key question. It's something that people have been debating and have been very angry about and have been almost killing each other <laughs> uh, for the last couple of years. So I wish we had more. But w what I see based on these trials is two trials with very consistent results. With, with a benefit in the range of something like 10% relative risk reduction, my interpretation is that masks do work. They do reduce the possibility of transmission in real life, probably in the range of 10%. Now, could you have an efficacy that is higher? Of course. I mean, if, if you have the perfect mask with the perfect uh, mask uh, wearing procedures and with 100% compliance in the population, and also people being isolated uh, in their refrigerator or in a closed room uh, rather than meeting anyone. Uh -huh. Or, you know, now we would be talking, we would be not only wearing a mask, uh, goodness, we're very close. But I will run out of, of the camera. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, then, then we would get close to 100%, you know, if, if you yeah. avoid all exposure, but this cannot be done. Correct. So I, I have always been in favor of masks because I think that they're an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I never really believed that they would be 
effective. And I, I always worried that people probably were over trusting mm -hmm. the fact that they were wearing masks yeah. and uh, probably exposing themselves sometimes in circumstances that they would be infected, but they thought that the mask would just take care of this. Um, so th the results of these trials are pretty congruent with, with my bias mm -hmm. in, in a sense. And I, th I think that probably they do work uh, not 80% under real world circumstances. May, maybe under some conditions you can get a bit more than 10%. Maybe in some subgroups you can get a bit more, but in others maybe you get less. I mean, there was some age stratification that suggested, you know, bigger benefits in older individuals, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. in the Bangladesh trial, and right. less or no benefit in younger. Right. Um, so, as I said, no trial is perfect. I, I, I'm willing to take that number and run with it, that 10%, 11%. Now, what does it mean in terms of policy? You see that different countries decide very different things about it. I, I was in Europe uh, last two months uh, for a series of, of lectures uh, over a month, and uh, every place I went had a very different policy. Mm -hmm. Each time I had to ask, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, right. And sometimes masks were everywhere, and some other times no one was wearing masks. I would, mm -hmm. I would seem stupid if I tried to wear a mask. Uh, even though I do believe that they do right. work. <laughs> what do you think? Um, both of these randomized control trials were done in a uh, immune naive population. Both zero prevalence at baseline was low, and mm -hmm. vaccination was low. Yeah. Now we extrapolate to San Francisco this month. Effect size is going to go down. I think that that applies to any sort of intervention once you get to saturation. Right. And uh, of course, saturation is uh, probably dynamic because you have people who lose their immunity over time. And a very important question, of course is to see how quickly that immunity is right. lost with different types of immunity induction, you know, natural versus vaccines, different mm. type of vaccination schedules. Uh, but indeed, I mean, you know, once you have a saturated environment, if you have, for example, a perfect vaccine and if right. masks are 100% effective, but everyone is infected, then they will seem as if they have no benefit at all, Right, right. Uh, which, which sounds very weird. And is that unrealistic? I don't think it's unrealistic because my estimate is that probably we've had something in the range of 4 billion infections around the world already. Uh, Half the world's global population. A global population, yeah. I, and many people probably have been infected twice uh, already. So, you know, maybe 3 plus billion infected once and who knows, mm -hmm. half a billion mm -hmm. plus mm -hmm. infected twice. Uh, this is very speculative, of course, mm -hmm. but, uh, but in my, some countries it's even more than mm -hmm. that percentage. And of course, some others are still in lower numbers. So, so the, the level of saturation does make a difference in terms of what measures you want to use and uh, whether their effectiveness will remain the same or will be higher than you have seen in some trials or mm -hmm. be lower. The good news is in, in this country that the places with the highest vaccination also wear the mask most religiously. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the good news. The good. But I want to ask you about the passive versus active surveillance of harms for vaccines. Somebody sent me a very interesting study you know, one of the, um, as part of the original, um, uh, as part of the approval of the Pfizer vaccine, they're under post-marketing commitments to generate safety data. One of those safety studies is they have to take a cohort of kids or adolescents and perform troponin levels on them. So we know myocarditis as it's being co collected, first of all, it's collected at many downstream of everything. Is there a doctor who has the wherewithal to report it? But of course, the person has to have chest pain that has to prompt the evaluation. Then they have to go in and potentially get diagnosed with the problem. That means somebody has to chest, check something, an EKG, a troponin, a cardiac MR, uh, and then they have to be often hospitalized for observation, um, and it has to be reported. But this will just actually collect the information. Somebody sent me a very interesting study about um, a prior vaccination, a smallpox vaccine, um, and they tried to estimate the, the what's under the, the iceberg of uh, subclinical myocarditis, and it was, it was 40 to 50-fold higher. I mean, it was substantively higher. Um, so I guess I'm curious. Um, well, I mean, one question is, how do you think about passive versus active surveillance? But isn't a bigger, uh, separate from the entire pandemic, I feel like we need a, a we need a whole new system to actively surveil people who get any drug or any vaccine, because I think we're really missing a lot of adverse events across the board. This is true, and and adverse events have received little attention compared to effectiveness in all of clinical research preceding COVID nineteen. It's not a COVID nineteen feature. I think that if anything, probably we did a bit better than average in terms of trying to collect information and harms on COVID-19 interventions compared to what we were doing all along. As you recall, some of my earlier work, uh, 
uh, when I started working in evidence-based medicine themes was related to the importance of recording harms of interventions. And a JAMA paper uh, more than 20 years ago, we looked at how much space was devoted to reporting of harms mm, in, in uh, papers of, mm. of randomized trials. And the amount of space was less than the amount of space given to author names. Uh, <laughs> this has improved a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been many efforts. Uh, uh, we have come up with guidelines uh, and recommendations like harms reporting uh, in concert. Uh, we had a paper in 2004 that we have revised the guidelines and we will be publishing that hopefully soon. Trying to draw more attention to the need of both collecting and reporting and disseminating information on harms more reliably. And when it comes to reliable information, obviously active versus passive perseverance does make a huge difference because mm -hmm. you, you don't know exactly what is the multiplying factor. And uh, the, the uncertainty can be huge. It could be times two or it could be times 50, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. depending on the type of adverse event, depending on the setting, depending on how aggressively the, the population has been sensitized mm -hmm. and, and how likely they are to report. Or desensitized. Or desensitized. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, yeah. you know, reporting a, an adverse event may become like a political statement, right. yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. com completely crazy yeah, I mean, to, yeah. to think of, the, of this this way. Um, so I, I think that uh, we need studies that are more carefully done. We need studies that are more in depth in collecting information, that are more active in collecting information. And here I want to add an asterisk. These studies that are very much in depth and, and you know, very active and very detailed and, and very aggressive in collective information may reach the point of being even more misleading sometimes. Hmm. Because, I mean, do I know if uh, 500 of my enzymes right now that we're talking are Correct, off? are elevated. You know, right, I yeah. haven't checked myself today. Right, right. right. <laughs> if, if I checked all my proteins, right. maybe a few hundred of them would be a little bit off. Right. And, and then you would... Uh, uh, you know, rush me to the hospital. Right. Uh, I don't know. Stanford is nearby. Uh, UCSF. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need to check my insurance. <laughs> Your point but, is well taken. But I so, so right I, 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 much in the same way as I worry that for the benefit side of things and for the risk of coronavirus, we kind of of overstimulated the population. You know, with with all that uh, uh, con conveyance of information, so many cases and so many. Um, which I'm in favor of testing, but you know when you, when you communicate that and you 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 focus on big numbers, people just get so crazy or you know get so afraid mm -hmm. of goodness. There's so many cases. Mm -hmm. In fact, the cases are like 10, 20 times more in some countries. There are a hundred times more in, in early stages of the than pandemic. What you're documenting. Um, yeah. But who, who cares about that? Right. Um, who should care about that? I think the same thing. We should be very careful with adverse events that are picked just by some very fancy, you know, metabolomics testing or, or, or biochemical testing that shows a little bit of an abnormality that maybe would have absolutely no clinical consequences. The, the, the whole thing, you know, both on the benefits and the harm side, reminds me of, I mean, the, the analogy that I give, because I love opera, it's like having a, an opera of Wagner that uh, you start singing and it takes four hours uh, it has taken two years and you start singing it one octave higher hmm. than it should be mm -hmm. and then you're stuck for four hours to have to <laughs> sing it <In> the wrong <laughs> Com completely off mm -hmm. and and I, I think that this is happening you know people were, were terrified with the virus and then they were terrified with the vaccines and then they were terrified with Omicron, they were terrified about yeah. everything. So I, I don't want to have people terrified about harms of vaccines. Right. The, 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 this will be a, a very wrong message. Right, that's really well put. Um, let's see, okay, and uh, it relates to another thing I wanted to ask you about, testing. Um, you know, I was thinking, I don't know, maybe I'm off a little bit, but uh, you know, with on, on a given day, how many, even through COVID-19, how many person-to-person -person interactions are there? Probably 100, 200, 300, 400 billion human interactions. You and I interacting, we're going to interact in a minute. I'm going to go to get some gas, you know, all these things, interactions um, to different degrees, different proximity, different sort of human connection. It's different in sub-Saharan Africa versus California versus, you know. Um, but And we also have testing, and we have a group of scientists who are vocally proponents of testing, more testing, keep testing, even after vaccination. We need to test. We need testing in school. We need testing international travel. And I think of the universe of human interactions, they're covering like one one millionth of 1% or maybe one one thousandth of, you know, some very tiny fraction, international travel and these things. Um, and I think that, 
you know, testing as many parts to it. It's the accuracy of the test. It's giving the information back quickly. And I know many of these tests, I don't get it back for three, four days. It's actually getting the information to the person. I suspect some of these testing companies know that there's some people never phone back to get the test result. I'm, I'm sure they have that internal data. They don't want to share that. Um, once you get the information, you have to be able to do something about it. If I use a rapid test that f I feel sick and I test negative, I might go meet my grandmother, even though that's a very high risk activity because um, I was actually positive the test was wrong. Um, conversely, I might use it in a good way and stay home when I should uh, go out. And I guess my question is, I don't know, at this point of the pandemic, with as many people have been infected and as many different places the virus has gone, is there a role for testing, uh, maybe perhaps nursing homes or some high risk situations? Uh, is there a such thing as over testing? Is testing a magic answer? Uh, what about travel? What are your thoughts on this testing question? <laughs> Okay, that that's a very tough question, and I, mm -hmm. I can give different answers. Okay, because okay. <laughs> because I think that uh, different answers are appropriate for different settings and, and different circumstances. In, in principle, I'm in favor of testing, and uh, in the very early days of the pandemic, one of my key arguments is that we need more testing. Right. And, and back then, we were doing very little testing. Unfortunately, in this country, things went really bad because our testing capacity was horrible. CDC just uh, didn't succeed in getting a good testing uh, procedure uh, established, and uh, we, we did very little testing. And that was true in many other countries. My heroes in the first few months were places like Iceland, places like South Korea, that were doing a lot of testing. And this meant that they could really find out where the virus was going, who were the infected people, who they had infected, and really achieve very good results. And these results continue to be extremely good. So. In principle, I believe that if there's one piece of our modern science that we could throw in, uh, especially before the advent of vaccines, that was testing rather than lockdowns and you know just mm -hmm. shutting down everything and closing schools and uh, just destroying everybody's mental health. And testing doesn't you know destroy your mental health. You can still work. You can still go to school. You can st still do pretty much everything. You I just say, get it's tested. least onerous restriction. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, although, I mean, obviously, if you get uh, detected, then, you know, <laughs> and every time I test myself, I'm thinking, especially when I'm abroad, oh, yeah. goodness, now we'll be stranded yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but nevertheless, I'm in favor of, of testing. I think it, it gives you an ability to track the pandemic. The, the other component that I'm very much in favor of, and I was always in favor of from the very beginning, was epidemiological surveillance that requires testing. Mm -hmm. But random surveillance. Random right, surveillance, yeah. yes. Or, or as close to random. To be honest, you can never achieve the perfect random mm -hmm. circumstances. They learned that in Bangladesh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I, I learned it also myself yeah. <laughs> yeah. in studies that I did. Yeah. But still, you can get some better sense compared uh -huh. to just letting people come to you or just letting you know, different policies that induce testing under different circumstances. And you, know, you, you miss really the hot points uh, in, in the first wave, for example, we did testing and uh, we didn't do testing in nursing homes. Mm. And, and you have now some data coming from nursing homes in Madrid or Italy showing five times higher uh, seroprevalence in the first wave mm -hmm. compared to the general population mm. or, or, or 10 times, you know, in, in Madrid it was like 50% versus 5% or five to 10% in the general population. So, so I, I think that Testing in some environments is always a good thing to do. You know, nursing homes, extremely high risk settings, settings where you have high chances of getting infected, where you have a very active epidemic wave and lots of people around you might be infected. In other circumstances, the benefits may be less. I don't want to say do not test because, again, my bias is in favor of testing. The testing companies have not paid me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Parentheses, no companies have paid me for anything. Um, that's uh, the way that I work. Uh, uh, but now maybe I can ask them uh, yeah, you know, right, after this now interview. Now you get an endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> some testing, <laughs> some ads on this video, yeah. Big uh, testing, come to it. Um, no, of course not. Of course not, uh, yeah. But uh, I think that once we move to a different environment, we need to think about how does the pandemic end? And how do we move the, to the endemic phase? The endemic phase means that we don't have more deaths than we can tolerate and what has been the case before mm -hmm. COVID-19 arose, but also we don't have 
a crazy arrangement of our life and crazy measures and you know crazy kind of superimposed structures and testing could be part of it so so somehow we need to disentangle sooner or later when it comes to epidemiology also um, the fact that we do so much testing nowadays means that probably in countries that do that their counts of events like deaths are probably inflated mm -hmm. uh, they were undercounted in the early days so I think we missed deaths in the early days when we did very little testing and in some countries that continue to do little testing they're still undercounting but in countries that, that do massive testing at the moment and we have some evidence we I mean even in California we had Alameda and mm -hmm. Santa Clara that revised mm -hmm. their death counts right. down by 25 percent correct I have some data that we're generating from uh, Germany with colleagues and hopefully we will publish them as well I see I hope. Uh, soon. You mean you'll ascribe deaths to SARS-CoV-2 that are not due to SARS-CoV-2, they just happen to be picked indeed, up. Indeed, right? indeed. And, and I, I don't want to come up with a conspiracy theory oh, right. here. No, it's just we, the... we need very careful audit of data to try to understand exactly what happened mm -hmm. and how the testing result uh, corresponds to the clinical picture eventually of uh, someone who died. I think or it's someone who was hospitalized. Yeah, yeah, I think it's important, and I think that... Um, you know, we don't do ourselves any favors by not being able to think about this objectively, as I think some people are very scared to talk about. But, um, you know, att attributing death has never been easy. It's always difficult. And and if testing is applied in an uneven manner or in a very aggressive manner, if there is incentive to finding positivity, then, of course, it will be there'll be misattribution. And it can be misattribution both directions. And Indeed. sometimes both directions simultaneously, you know, at the same place. Excess mortality, I know people put so much stock in, but it is also very flawed because excess mortality depends on the counterfactual world where you are all doing the same things you would be doing. And so if you disrupt all of society and you start to look at excess mortality, well, no one is taking their bicycle, no one's going on bicycle, no one's going on for yeah. commuting and driving and going to work and getting the stress of waking up in the morning to go to work. And so I don't know what to make with excess mortality. I think it's such a blunt instrument. I, I published a paper in the European Journal of Epidemiology mm -hmm. uh, several months ago specifically discussing overestimation and underestimation right. of deaths and I also tried to discuss issues of excess deaths and how these relate to the uh, pandemic and COVID-19 related deaths in, in particular. So the the paper has a pretty elaborate mathematical model that goes behind the, the reasoning mm -hmm. and you can use it to get an estimate of whether you have under or overestimation of death under different circumstances. There's lots of factors <clears throat> that go into this calculation, including the amount of testing, but it's also the background mortality in the population. Mm. It's the definition of the window of mm -hmm. when you count death as related to COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, the infection fatality rate. So, so there's multiple factors. And that means that you have some uncertainty uh, in terms of being able to tell who really died uh, from COVID-19. You need very much in-depth auditing, and death certificates are one level, but ideally you need to go even deeper deeper into mm -hmm. medical records, and even medical records are flawed. And, and we know that way before the pandemic, mm -hmm. that death certificates are, are very unreliable. Mm -hmm. They're mostly kind of you know, documents that someone needs to fill out at uh, two o'clock after midnight when someone dies and they do their best. Right. But we know that people don't fill out death certificates with high accuracy. Medical records, you're an active clinician. You, you know what a mess they can be. It's a mess. Um, they, they have always been so. It, it's not that someone is having a conspiracy for right. COVID-19. Right. So you, you really need to look very much in depth. When it comes to excess deaths, excess deaths are a composite of multiple factors. They're, mm -hmm. they're COVID-19, then you have the indirect effects of COVID-19. So mm -hmm. if you have a health system that is overrun mm -hmm. by COVID-19 for a good reason or for a bad reason, then you have many other diseases that mm -hmm. get completely mismanaged or you cannot manage them or people you know, would die of many other things or they do, would not get the best care that they should. Right. So you have that added layer right. uh, or other types of indirect effects. Right. And then you have all the direct and indirect effects of the measures that of you have the restrictions, taken. right. Yeah. The restrictions. And you know some of the measures are, are really devastating and many others probably are just beneficial. I'm not trying to say that you know all measures out right. of the 12,000 measures that right. we no. have thrown at yeah. this beast 
uh, were detrimental. Some probably were beneficial, others were detrimental, some were very detrimental, but I think the, the most draconian ones probably were pretty de detrimental. Mm -hmm. So you need to factor all of those into account and then add more modeling um, about time series of mortality, mm -hmm. which is a very difficult thing to do. Why, when, what do you mean by time series? That you need to, to track the uh -huh. mortality trends over time yeah. in the same location, same country. Yeah. And, and this has a lot of uncertainty. You know, some countries uh, may have five, seven percent differences in mortality from one year to the next mm. for no reason. Right. You know, I impossible to, to explain why. I mean, if I you see. start looking, you can start speculating, you can say it was this or it was that, or it was I a see. combination of multiple things. So we need this data. But we have to be very careful to say that excess deaths are going to tell us what COVID-19 did. Mm -hmm. Excess deaths are going to tell us what COVID-19 plus indirect effects plus we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably mostly will tell us what we did. Nice. That's what I wonder about. Um, no, your point's well taken. I mean, even before COVID, of course, in the cancer screening debates, there's so many randomized trials and many of which are negative. And, you know, you've done some nice meta-analysis on that. And I've been interested. And many years ago, I asked this student of mine, a resident at the time, Joaquin Chapa, I said, uh, a lot of people were using population statistics to indirectly infer the effectiveness of screening campaigns. And in doing so, they were using death certificates. And so I asked him, like, when I read that, you know, there's a reduction in 15% of prostate cancer deaths in America over the last 10 years, how do they get that number? And he went off and he was literally gone for a year. <laughs> <laughs> and he like really dug into it, the death certificates, the algorithms they use, the places they sample, the locations they sample, demographic changes in those locations over time as we've had a huge influx of uh, Hispanic people into America over time. Do they adjust for some of these things? They're not adjusting for some of these uh, changes in population, uh, demographics they're not adjusting for. Um, how do they treat the death certificate? How If something says they had a PE and prostate cancer and Alzheimer's disease, which was the cause of death, the algorithm has changed over time. And by the time he came back to the end, he said it's like, you know, it's like it's like knowing how the sausage is made. Once you really know how it's made, you don't want to eat it anymore. You know, like he just didn't trust the statistic at all. And that was sort of what we wrote about. Um, but it wasn't easy to get to the bottom of these statistics. They're very I, I, open. I agree. And as I say, I'm I'm trying to work on that front and I have some ongoing studies. Uh, I, I hope that we present them with sufficient nuance because nuance is really indicated when you present this type of data. But um it, it's not easy at all. It's not easy at all. It, it, it sounds weird. It's about death. Right. The I most mean, objective if, thing in the world. It, the <laughs> most objective thing. I mean, it's not like 20% uh, yeah. you're dead and 80% you're alive. <laughs> yeah. uh, but counting deaths and especially attributing deaths is, is extremely difficult. Uh, you need to take multiple factors into account. Many of those you're not even aware that may be determined at the local level mm -hmm. based on policy level, based on kind of instructions or the micro environment, what people say or or what people are, are trained to do in filling out certificates. Uh, it, it can be extremely complex and extremely convoluted, but uh, I, I think we need to do that. We, mm -hmm. we need to just go back and look very carefully to, to try to get the best estimates possible. And of course, keep tracking excess deaths because uh, that information is, is like the, the final bottom line, mm -hmm. in a sense, mm -hmm. not just for COVID-19, but for for everything that happens to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's good to know that mm -hmm. in the last two years, probably we've had, uh, I don't know, 300 million people who were born and mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe 120 million uh, who died. Mm -hmm. And some of them, 5 million plus, have a COVID-19 diagnosis attached to them. But there's many others falling in different bins. Uh, right. s some some of the most important bins probably we, we ignore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to give you one example, uh, I was looking at the, the data for, for Greece, mm -hmm. and Greece had a very sharp spike in the middle of the summer. And uh, that was just at the week that there were some very bad fires, wildfires, mm -hmm. next to Athens, which has like half the Greek population. Mm -hmm. Inhaled smoke. And, and we had a tremendous spike that was far worse than anything that coronavirus did. Mm -hmm. And the government was very happy because they evacuated all these areas. But probably far more people died just because of the combination of heat wave and toxic inhalation during mm -hmm, these days. And, mm -hmm. and that was just it know, not, not, not even mentioned. Right. And it may precipitate things they don't think of as attributable, like heart attacks or stroke or something. Of, of like, course. Right, yeah. Of course. And I'm wondering your thoughts on, um, you wrote a paper on this, um, a very interesting paper, comparing 
I don't know, you, you've done a few pro projects of this, comparing car the scientists who are on television, who sign documents. I wonder if you talk a little bit about, you know, th the media is interesting. They have the universe of scientists to choose from. They choose some scientists, they cover them. Um, and people have pointed to some disparities uh, in terms of how many men are coming on TV, how many women, and some other characteristics you've explored. I wonder if you might talk about that research. So that was a paper that I, I really enjoyed uh uh, working with, I, I worked on it with uh, Reshma Jagsi from mm -hmm. University Michigan. of Michigan uh, and a medical student also from the University of Michigan. And um, we we wanted to see who are these people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're so visible. Yeah. Uh, they appear all the time in, yeah. in the news. They shape our lives. <laughs> uh, they tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, what is their background and uh, what do they know and uh, what have, have they published <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> in their lives? So, so we, we got lists of highly visible media mm -hmm. experts uh, in the US, in Switzerland, in Denmark, and in Greece. And the common denominator was that, uh, number one, uh, women were underrepresented. Uh, we could not see in uh, ethnic minorities and, and racial background, but I bet that that was also a major uh, imbalance. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, we couldn't look in, in great detail. And many of them, have never published anything on COVID-19. <laughs> mm. uh, and also many of them have very limited scientific impact in their whole career. Mm -hmm. uh, there's exceptions and there's many that have great scientific impact and many that are very active uh, COVID-19 researchers. So it's not like a black and white, but, but there's many people who are very prominent in the news all over the world who have published nothing and have very little in terms of scientific credentials that would make them relevant for what they're talking about. Now, does it matter? Do you think it like, Oh goodness. What, what do you learn by publishing that you uh, don't learn by reading? Well, uh, if most published research findings are false, maybe it's good for them. <laughs> Not to have, have you contributed <laughs> to the noise. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, to be honest, I, I think that if you take the responsibility to try to inform people, you should know what you're talking about. And the, the best way to know about, what you're talking about is to publish something and, and still be wrong. I mean, that's mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, still have that experience, still, st still have your hands on, on that work and that discipline, because otherwise I, I think that, uh, we're, we're, it's, it's like asking me about earthquakes. Mm -hmm. I, you know, what do you know about it? I will yeah. probably hit the textbooks. And, uh, if you force me to become an earthquake expert, I, and then I like it, you know, I, <laughs> I appear in the news. Yeah, uh, and people celebrate. Regardless crazy. of whether it's CNN or Fox, yeah. I mean, I'm the earthquake expert. Everyone yeah. in California is yeah. uh, is listening to Johnny Anidis yeah. uh, <laughs> about yeah. the earthquake. And of course, I will fail you, yeah. uh, isn't it? I mean, it's very likely that I will fail you. So, I, I think that um, it's it's pretty important for for all these mass media outlets to do a little bit of bibliometrics <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, and look up who are these people that uh, they're inviting mm -hmm. and of course to think about all the inequalities that we were talking earlier right, of who you're that featuring. include gender and racial and all other issues that create a toxic society mm -hmm. you know we don't want to make that worse i mean i agree with you completely that they are inviting a certain character and and that's not the character that's committed i think to science and I agree with you that bibliometrics also, you're using it. It's a crude surrogate for the thing you're really getting after. Now, what is the thing you're getting after that you learn from publishing papers and from being in this line of work, which is that, you know, if you give a hundred people, even at prestigious universities who work on in medicine, a paper to read and you say, read this and tell me what you think, it will be very difficult for many of them to actually do such a task. They can, they're happy to read it and tell you what was written and what the authors thought of their own data. They're happy to go on Twitter and talk to some colleagues at the water cooler and tell you what they thought about it or what they're saying they think about it, which may be very similar to the original message. But very few will try to really think about it in uh, have developed their own systematic way of how to think about it, which is, you know, obviously you think, what is the core question? What is the philosophical question they're getting at? If I were to think about that question and do the research, having done so much research in the past, how would I try to do it, knowing the limitations of available data, who will give me data, the problems with the data, how dirty the data is and messy the data is, and all that kind of sausage making that goes into it. 
and, and with, with that knowledge, you also temper your enthusiasm for the result you're gonna get out of the end product. You'll also think, what are the classic pitfalls? You know, the classic biases, the immortal time bias, the guarantee bias, the confounding, obviously, that's gonna happen in this data set, the selection bias that's obviously gonna be there. And you know those things because you've been burned by them before on projects that someone else pointed out to you. Um, so I think what you're really getting at, like the thing you want the person on TV to be, is that if they're gonna come and inform the public, to some degree, they should have done the due diligence of read that and thought about it and interpreted it with their own brain and no one else's brain. And and one metric for that is having published a lot because you can't get that far. I mean, you can't publish a few hundred papers if you've never done that. But some people manage to do that. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> some indeed, some yeah. people manage to do some, that. Some people are offered free lunch. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you never know. I mean, yeah. whether an expert can really stand behind their bibliography, and yes, whether they can really correct. defend their papers. And I, I know several people probably who cannot defend their papers, yeah. <laughs> but no names mentioned that. Right. Um, so I, th I think that being an expert or being an acclaimed expert does not secure that you will come up and say something that is true, accurate, mm. uh, appropriate. I mean, you can still mess things up. but not being an expert, you know, being irrelevant, not, not having any relevance to, to the field, not having worked in the field, not having published anything, even worse, not having a strong scientific background, then, uh, I mean, you, you just... The odds are against you at the outset. You're just trying to be lucky. <laughs> I'll give you a good example of a paper that I think that, uh, you know, every, many people talk about, and I don't think anyone talked about that well, which is, you know, this... Um, as myocarditis became increasingly recognized, particularly in boys 12 to, 20, to 12 to now 30, arguably 12 to 24, in that age group, that's the highest r increased risk. Um, you know, I think many people, myself included, rewrote many things saying that there's got to be a way to m reap most of the benefits of vaccination and mitigate the harm, such as a one-dose strategy, change the dose, space the doses out. Let's try different things. But um, if you have a body public that's unwilling to accept that this risk is worth taking seriously, there will be no effort to mitigate the risk. Um, you can have most of the vaccine efficacy, perhaps with one dose, and spare these 12-year-old boys the risk of myocarditis. Um, but one of the papers that was published was a paper that tried to argue that, of course, the myocarditis is much higher with the virus than with the vaccine. And one of the methods of that is in the vaccine calculation, you know how many cases presented to hospitals divided by how many vaccines you gave. That denominator, I think, is a rock solid denominator. The numerator actually has some variability in it because maybe some people have chest pain at home and they brush it off or they don't take it seriously or they continue on. So the numerator variable, the denominator though rock solid, I think we do know how many people got the shot. Maybe some error there in some, you know, but in this age group, I think not much error. The other side of the equate, the ledger, post COVID-induced myocarditis, the numerator, yeah, maybe you do know how many people came to the hospital and they have MR abnormalities or EKG abnormalities, or you know the numerator. But the denominator, what they used was the number of people who were hospitalized with a multiplier of, I think they used three. And I don't know where they got three. <laughs> they just, <laughs> just and pulled out the three. Yeah. Um, but you and I know that that multiplier might be the wrong multiplier. And it might not be off by a little, it might be off by a lot. And a better way to do that would be to do a sort of zero prevalence estimate. And now that these Germans have published their really brilliant paper looking at kids, I emailed the author and asked that he should just look at the myocarditis because now they have a denominator that's rock solid. Yeah. Okay, when I turn on television, when I looked on CNN and MSNBC on this, I see expert after expert brought out to point out that, of course, the vaccine has myocarditis, but we know, we know the virus has more myocarditis. And I just don't think they do know because I don't think they read the paper and I don't think they know how to think about it. It's, it's hard to tell, and, and you're bringing up an example that obviously is very contested. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I don't want to add yet another expert <laughs> voice uh, okay. to, to give a sense of certainty about something that there's still some debate, as, as you say. Um, I think that applies to any type of paper. We, we know that there's a lot of illiteracy and a lot of innumeracy among experts, right. <laughs> let alone non-experts in medicine, Evidence-based medicine has been a brilliant idea, but it has stumbled upon innumeracy and illiteracy. And uh, I, I've seen some improvement over time, but most experts are innumerate. Most experts, you know, can barely probably add five plus seven and get it to be twelve. Uh, if you ask for more than that, you're getting into trouble. And I guess, like, I mean, one example of that is these every every few years somebody does a survey where they say pretest probability is X. The test has these test characteristics. Oh goodness! And that, then they ask experts, "What's the post of probability?" And they're all over the place. It's like throwing darts I, at a dartboard. Garrett Gigeranger has done yes. amazing work. Has published many books and many papers on on these issues that have been with us 
before the pandemic, during the pandemic. They will continue to be with us after the pandemic. I, I think it's very unfortunate. The, the, the least that we can do is to recognize it, to, to recognize the limitations of both experts and non-experts when it comes to appraising risks and appraising numbers and appraising maybe CNN relative should. risks uh, yeah. or comparisons mm -hmm. of absolute risks uh, it, it it can get very very confusing so eventually what you get is mostly messaging that tends to be pretty consistent because one expert kind of follows what other experts have said and you have a, a domino effect and uh, again it depends on on what uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of venue you appear because there's separate domino effects in one type of political inclination mm -hmm. and separate domino effect in, in the opposite party. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's right. And um, I think, uh, I mean, one, hy one hypothesis is maybe CNA should administer a test, a 10 question test of simple, st simple th <laughs> and see if- th You failed the expert uh, test. Yeah, you can't go on TV. <laughs> the problem is they'll have trouble getting someone to go on TV who's also, I think the other flip side of the equation is it's not enough to be able to get the test question That'll right. That'd be quite embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think they'll, they'll, fail. they'll fail. I know these people will fail. Um, uh, but the flip side of the equation is uh, you have to be articulate and make your point briskly, quickly, within the time limit. And that's also a skill. For better or worse, that's the way these yeah. media people live. But I'll give you an example. I just taught, um, you know, uh, uh, the, so the basic stuff, sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative likelihood ratio, um, post, uh, pre-test, post-test probability. Um, I really think it's like the most important thing, those calculations. But you've already mentioned so many terms that will kick you out of any news story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's not dumbed down. Goodness. I mean, you know, yeah. six technical terms yeah. that uh, are understood by zero point something percent of the yeah. population and maybe a couple of percent of experts. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I think, I don't know, but I feel like, I think you're right. I mean, I, I, positive predictive value. Goodness. Yeah. What is that? Have you ever heard that in any no. news coverage? The positive predictive value. And even like now with testing being so popular, they could talk about characteristics of tests, sensitivity, specific likelihood ratios and characteristics of tests plus the population you administer it on, but they never draw those distinctions. Oh. I don't think they okay. aware of it, but um, these are critical and they're not just critical for being on television. Of course, they're critical for day-to-day -day bedside medicine. You of know, course. you see classic errors of reasoning of and Bayesian reasoning and statistical reasoning. But you know, I was thinking about it a little bit more broadly. I mean, I think there is a challenge, which is that probabilistic thinking is the hardest thing for people to do. And it is easy to think with gestalt and heuristic and simple blunt force rules. And it's easy to try to make everything simple messaging, but probabilistic thinking, especially with one of the things that makes this virus so hard for people to wrap their mind on is it isn't, you know, it isn't every other person who spreads it to one other person. It's like one in 20 people who spreads it to 20 people. And that kind of distribution of events makes it very difficult to sort of have a, with a small data set to infer which is more transmissible. And you're, you're drawing that inference from a data set where maybe two random, two, two chance events led to the whole domination of the clone, yeah. you know, yeah. domination of the strain. Um, and it's very difficult to kind of convey those. I think they could do it, though, like with um, visual displays with dice or, you know, some kind of the, graphics. The, there are possibilities. That, you know, some of them are graphics or, or visuals. And there is a, a whole science of science communication. Mm. And I, I think that we're not using it as much as, as we should. Personally, I feel very often that I fail to communicate. Uh, things that I felt would be very essential and very down to earth and very easy, but but then on second thought, I'm asking myself, well, who got that? Uh, I, did, did I make it clear enough? You feel like even when you give a lecture or something? Absolutely, mm. absolutely. And and you, you need to ask who is in the in the audience? What is their background? What do they know? When it comes to the general public, then things are even worse. And uh, of course, you need to start with a philosophy that you want to convey something that is not misleading. You need to do it very quickly. You have very limited time. Right. You need to do it avoiding terminology like positive predictive value right. that uh, you would need uh, probably a month of intense yeah. coursework to, right. to get them there and uh, still get it in a way that would be beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy. And I, I don't want to uh, come up with a message that we should discredit all <clears throat> these people who spend their lives uh, in uh, television trying to inform us because you know, it's a mission in a mm -hmm. sense and it, it's something that I, I believe they have the best intentions i don't think that they're there because they want to cheat or to to mislead people but it's very easy to mislead people mm. i think that you're right i mean i agree with everything you said the i think some of the things that they could do better about is i think that they have um 
it makes sense to me that on issues like is tobacco smoke linked to lung cancer that we have closure on that issue. It is. Yes, mm -hmm. odds ratio 20. Done. Move on. TV doesn't need to have a debate on does tobacco cause lung cancer. It's yeah. done. Yeah. But when you have a live issue you've never had before, at least, you know, not in the last hundred years, uh, not, you know, at least, um, well, you know, arguably this is a unique pandemic compared to any other point in history. Um, and you make unprecedented policy decisions. I mean, I've never seen global, the whole globe shut down over a short period of time and lockdowns and restrictions of these nature. I mean, it's never been done in the history of humanity yeah. Yeah. Uh, at this scale for this period of time. Um, I think it is inevitable that there are really serious people are gonna disagree f very vehemently about the net effects of those interventions. But I do think the media uh, had no appetite to hold any debates on this issue. They did the same thing they would for tobacco. They deemed some arguments heretical and not worthy of consideration. I recently saw a public health expert, who I believe is actually an expert, said that you know the problem with the Great Barrington Declaration was that focus protection, we know it was just never possible, end quote. And I've been reading a lot of D.A. Henderson's writings and some writings from pandemic guidance from circa, you know, 1985 to 2010. And I said, where was that that you knew that wasn't possible? Because <laughs> that was everything they said yeah. was yeah. built around the idea that we would have to do more for those who are more vulnerable and we would have to let society go on. I think what they didn't predict back then was the ability for Zoom, I think, to remove the high income labor force from this equation which I think mollifies the masses in the sense that, you know, if we actually had to lose our jobs, I think I, I, more of our professional class lost their jobs, they would be more up in arms about this. So you're really left only with people who are really, they just don't have the financial resources or even the cultural power to push for, um, you know, against these restrictions because they are down, down and out, the people who have to work in person. Um, they didn't envision that. And I think that's what, that's what D.A. Henderson probably missed. If D.A. Henderson were alive, I think, he would be you. I mean, I think all your policy positions throughout this pandemic, he would be very close to where you are, and he might have even signed the GBD. He would be close to Jay and Martin. Well, we, we need to reach out to him, and as you know, that's impossible. Yeah. And uh, as you know, I didn't sign the GBD. I know you didn't, yeah. I, I didn't sign the GBD, the Great Bank Declaration. I didn't sign the Jon Snow Memorandum. I haven't signed any petitions or open letters uh, or other documents that are making a plea to do something uh, based on the science that we all know uh, is true. And I have colleagues on both sides of, of that equation. I, I have great colleagues who I, I tremendously respect who signed the Great Bank the Declaration. I have other colleagues who I also tremendously respect mm -hmm. who, who signed the John Snow Memorandum. And I, th I think, honestly, if you look at uh, what they have published, they agree in many, many things, right. even though it seems as if they disagree on everything. There is a disagreement on lockdown issues, and of course I'm on the side that uh, draconian lockdowns are doing a lot of harm, and we can achieve equal or even more benefits with more targeted measures. But you're right that instead of debating scientifically, instead of just looking at data and exchanging information, it, it became very highly polarized and it became like a reputation war that uh, all, all these people are bad people and this is why they <laughs> right. they're telling us this uh, and and obviously that that was very detrimental for science mm -hmm. it, it was detrimental for all of us it was detrimental for public health this is not the way to make progress the, the, there's no way that you will gain something by discrediting colleagues uh, no matter what they say especially in a rapidly moving frontier uh, and uh, I'm I'm probably one of the most fierce proponents of declaring conflicts of interest. Of but course. that was not an issue of conflicts of interest. I know, that's what I uh, yeah. So I, I think very, it's very important to, to avoid displacing scientific debates into uh, something like uh, an arena, uh, a Roman arena for, uh, for gladiators uh, <laughs> and, and a, a smearing arena. Um, it, it just hurts everyone. And I, I feel very sorry for that the smearing has gone on throughout the pandemic as an antidote to scientific curiosity, mm. you know, kind, of, kind of diminishing scientific curiosity and scientific questioning with smearing. Let's with, talk about with, that uh, for a second. Uh, with, with just uh, annihilating your opponents mm -hmm. in, in a way. I just, I guess I want to say one thing. I also, I also didn't sign both. And you know, <laughs> I, I didn't sign both because 
the GBD didn't quite have what I wanted in there. I wanted some more, you know, calls to provide resources for people who are vulnerable and who still had to go to work. Jon Snow didn't have what I wanted in there, and it also had some things that I raised an eyebrow to, which was claims about durability of having had SARS-CoV-2 and recovered just from SARS-CoV-2, which they sort of dismissed. So I didn't have what I wanted there. But the point about smearing that I want to come to is that I think people do recognize that some people are smeared, and they're writing articles about scientists who have been smeared or attacked. But even in those articles, they're one-sided. So let me point out. So I believe that all the smearing is bad. If the public health official makes you wear a mask, even if you think it doesn't work, you shouldn't give them a death threat. That's not appropriate. You just have to live with this, the mask, and you know, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and I actually am very, have been very critical, and I wrote an Atlantic piece saying that I just don't think we should be doing it for young kids. I think there's no data, and it contradicts the World Health Organization and UNICEF guidance. So I used, I used to think they were credible sources, but apparently, <laughs> you know, okay. So I don't think, you know, but I got in a lot of heat for that. I, okay. So, but even if they were to recommend that, I don't believe that they should get a death threat, even though I disagree with them. I'm not going to give it. Okay. So I think there are lots of people on that side, uh, the zero COVID people. I don't know. Um, maybe event, I don't know if they still believe in zero. I think they do. <laughs> they want to kill all the deer or whatever you need to do to get to zero, kill all the deer and kill all the cats and kill, you know, whatever you need to do, get us to zero. But, you know, I disagree with them, but they should not be attacked or smeared. Um, there are also people on the other side, you know, people who've, who've signed GBD, who have been, you know, yourself and many others, and you have been smeared and attacked and received death threats and similar. And the hostility blows both ways for both for people who've taken both sides of this issue. But when I read articles like the article in Nature that covers who are the victims of the smearing, they only ever talk about the victims on the one side of the issue, <laughs> not the victims on the other side. And so they just don't see what they're doing, which is that if you want to be fair, you need to say that, yes, there are going to be people who hold different positions, and I don't believe you should be smeared even when I disagree with you, and you shouldn't believe that John should be smeared just because you disagree with him. Smearing is is bad no matter what. Yeah. And and personally, I'm interested to protect more those people who disagree with me. You know, th those people who agree with me uh, will will manage. <laughs> <laughs> but I I really feel horrible when I see people who disagree with me get smeared. And uh, to to those who are smearing them, I can only say if you want to smear someone, please smear me instead hmm. instead of my opponents. I, it would make me feel better uh, because. I feel it's very unfair for everyone. It's very unfair for I mean, everyone. The people it's most unfair to are the people who don't speak up because they see it. I, I think that we have eliminated the vast majority of scientists from, from these Commenting, debates. Commenting, yeah. Because they just don't want to deal with this mess. Well, uh, I think they say that if they can attack you in such a nasty way, you, course, who, you have yeah. published more papers than anyone, you know, or you know, one of the most cited scientists um, who's known for being very thoughtful if they can attack you in this way, they could just rip me to shreds. I think I've heard from many, many people who are amazing scientists. They, they just walked away. Mm. You know, they, they said COVID-19 is not what I'm going to deal with. Uh, there's so many other things to, to work on. Or even if they work on COVID-19, they pick uh, mm -hmm. and choose some topics that would be as uh, low risk as possible. Mm -hmm. Although... <laughs> <laughs> that's sometimes uh, not so easy to predict uh, <laughs> yeah, no. what will become high risk. You know, once uh -huh. you have a politician say something about uh, anything, then it can very easily become high risk uh, overnight. Right. And suddenly find yourself that, which party do I belong to? Right. <laughs> I didn't know about that. Right. <laughs> you know, there's a very interesting paper out now, just I guess this is, this is a non-COVID point, but, um, you know, Brian Nozick has finally published the replication effort for the cancer studies yeah. in eLife. Uh, and this is something that, you know, you're maybe 15 years ahead of everybody on this, which was that you recognized very early on that in an environment of human beings where um, as a scientist, there are many things you pursue, and one is the truth, but you also pursue your, your career. And a career in science is driven by discovery. I'm the person who discovered this, and this is important, and this is new, and this is good. Um, and in such an environment, if you pair that with, you know, low power, power failure, you pair that with multiple hypothesis testing, no pre-registration, the ability to pick and choose what results you present and when you present them, how you present them, how you frame them, uh, you're going to get an environment with a widespread deluge of false results with a tiny fraction being true and a tiny fraction of that being useful. And, you know, you've, you outlined that all very nicely in your, in the paper you're most famous for. Um, and now, of course, we're finally seeing you know, we've had reproducibility efforts in psych psychological science, um, and we've had um, reproducibility efforts in different domains, and now finally in the cancer biology. And I had a chance to look through the data, and it is, it's devastating. I mean, I think that there's no way to sugarcoat it. 
Uh, people will downplay it just like they did with psychology, but why is it so devastating? These are the creme de la creme of biomedical literature, the top research findings. When they claimed they had a null result, actually about 70, 80% of the time it was null in replication. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you claim I'm not, I'm nothing special, yep. I am nothing yep. special. But when you claim I found something new, maybe in different estimates, it ranged from something like 20% to maybe 60%, but around 40% were really reproducible, that it was true in the same direction and significant, and you actually found something. The most were not true. And these are the best studies by the best laboratories. Now, I think some people will claim that, well, you know, the, re the reproducibility effort, it didn't have enough power. Well, it usually had much more power. Um, it, yeah. Well, we, they changed the reagents. Well, they got the original investigator to agree to those reagent changes. Um, there's this sort of straw man people argue, which is that it's not the exact same experiment on the exact same day with the exact same conditions. But I think it's a straw man because science is not supposed to tell you what happens just in that moment. It's to tell you some truth about the world. And so if it's exactly. never, if it's never it true should, any other time. It should be happening all the time. It should be happening all the time. So I wonder what you think of the most recent reproducibility effort. I, th I think it was a great effort and obviously it took uh, many years mm -hmm. to accomplish it. And I'm very happy to, to see the results and uh, Brian and his team has done an amazing uh, job in opening our eyes mm -hmm. and reproducibility themes around very different uh, disciplines in science. They're very consistent with what we have seen in other fields. So the, the rates of reproducibility are probably very consistent with psychology, even though psychology and cancer research are very, very far apart mm -hmm. in the universe of uh, bibliometrics mm -hmm. uh, or, or science maps. And that says something about probably the very basic characteristics of how we do science in most scientific fields. As you say, we have no pre-registration, we have very little sharing or no sharing. We have a lot of uh, post hoc uh, searches, uh, a lot of opportunistic research that mm -hmm. is exploratory. And very often it's not even acknowledged that it's exploration that uh, we're doing. And mm -hmm. um, that's what you expect to get under such circumstances, a lot of irreproducibility. Having a lot of interest in a scientific field is, is one of the factors that I had presented in my 2005 paper as being a predictor of irreproducibility. Right. And I think that cancer research is a field that has many people who are interested, mm -hmm. and there's different stakeholders who are interested in mm -hmm. coming up with discoveries in that mm -hmm. field. So probably have extra reasons that uh, you would have low reproducibility. Coming back to COVID-19, goodness, yes. that's the highest interest I have seen in any scientific field. Yes. And that does not pretend a very good outcome right. when we go back 10 years down the road. If we, if we still have planet Earth uh, in its place and <laughs> right. we haven't blown it up, right. uh, yeah. right. <laughs> uh, looking back, I, I, I think we'll, we'll be... I don't want to say we will be laughing. I think we will be crying, yeah. unfortunately, with what happened. I think it'll be massive irreproducibility. Um, the next thing that's in the news, the Theranos, uh, she's, I think she's finally fessing up in tri on trial. Yes. And this was something that you wrote about. You were one year before John Kerry Roo when uh, you walked by the building that day and you saw, <laughs> and then you looked for their, you PubMed'd them and it was blank. Uh, you know, they could have gone, been an expert on CNN with the way that PubMed looked. <laughs> <laughs> All black. Yes, uh, they, they were in CNN and, yeah. and uh, everywhere. <laughs> she was everywhere. Um, okay, so, you know, I think you were vindicated there. And then the third thing, COVID-19, where I think you you said very early on that we need more data. And and to be honest, had they had they always done that those random zero prevalence and made it public on a website, we would have been better off. In fact, right now, we would be making better decisions around kids' vaccination because we would know the zero prevalence in Alabama and New York City might be very different than zero prevalence in, in mm -hmm. California. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one may clearly, I think, the risk-benefit suggests very likely a benefit for the 16-year-old overweight boy with type 1 diabetes. Get your vaccine quickly. But the 6-year-old uh, who has already had COVID-19 and recovered – you know, healthy, not overweight, had the disease and recovered, I think it's very difficult. And if you knew the zero prevalence in an area, you might be able to, to have an estimate of whether or not it was worth pushing so hard in some area. New York City now is saying that five-year-olds are not going to be able to go to restaurants unless they get vaccinated. Indeed, yeah. Well, I, I have always been in favor of making data, especially more reliable data, more widely available. Mm -hmm. And uh, COVID-19, in a way, exposed lots of people to lots of information, including lots of data. You know, people started playing with numbers on their daily life activities. I mean, they, everybody was kind of tracking cases and deaths and what's going on and hospitalizations. Uh, so the, the question is whether we focused on the right data. 
and whether at different points where major decision nodes had to uh, be acted upon and where we needed massive compliance or, or massive understanding for decision making, for shared decision making. Did we offer the right data? I think that we probably didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah prevalence is one type of information, as you mentioned, that uh, could have been helpful. Most of the time what I saw was that narratives were pushed that uh, media and authorities tried to make them appear as rock solid. Mm -hmm. And as if, if you don't do that, then you 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 are crazy. You're an idiot. You're stupid. Uh, mm -hmm. You're you're a murderer also right. uh, because you're killing other people. Right. Um, and I I think that this did not help. It it was a great opportunity for science to to show how powerful it is. We had great successes. Vaccines were an amazing success. I I don't think that many of us thought that uh, they it would be developed so, quick, so quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that, that we failed in much of the science communication. And uh, I'm not saying this to blame others. I, I blame myself just as well. I've, I've always struggled to say, well, how can you communicate better uh, under these kind of uh, crazy circumstances? What kind of information can you give? Especially when time is limited, as, as you say, in these three-minute spots. But even in lengthier interviews, we, we need to go back and look at our interview and see. Yeah, go oh, play goodness, back. I, I must have uh, said lots of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, it was, I think it was good. But um, I mean, I'm, inter I'm very interested in that. I could talk to you a long time about that. But I guess the point I was trying to make was, uh, you know, you're right about reproducibility. You were just, you were ahead of everybody. But they didn't hate you for it. And you were right about, I think, Theranos. But uh, some people hated you for that. <laughs> um, yeah. And COVID-19, I think, in um, largely you were right in a, in a lot of ways um, in that original piece and in your early comments, which was we didn't really know what we were getting into with the response and the downstream effects of the response. And I still think we still don't have a good sense of all the damage we have done. But we will see, I think, with tuberculosis is, going, is on the cusp of exploding, malaria is going to explode. The stories of starvation are going to come out from globally countries that have been dis just obliterated. And then even within this country, school closure, you're going to get stories of child abuse coming forward. You just have a few now, but more will come. And child abuse, loss of educational outcomes, a generation of kids that they're not going to be uh, reading at the same level as their even their parents or their older brothers did. They're not going to have the same upward mobility. They're going to have lower economic prospects. They're going to be more susceptible to propaganda and propagandists and bad politicians. They're going to vote in erratic ways. We've seen civil strife. We've seen countries on the verge of war, uh, troops on the border right now on the border of Ukraine. Um, you're going to see more disruption. You're going to see uh, the one thing that surprised me was I would have expected the stocks were going to be much worse than they are now, but we've had capital injected in the markets like we I didn't anticipate would be injected. But that has that will lead to a big backlash, which is that um, the the stock market people know that they'll always be bailed out, and they're just going to be more and more reckless. We thought they were reckless before 20, 2008. They're going to be more and more reckless, and I think we're going to see a lot of downstream consequences from this. It will likely be the defining event of the 20, this whole century, um, not the virus, but what we did about the virus, and I think the ways in which science has been treated. I, I'm pessimistic, I think. I don't think it'll recover. I think, there'll be, I think it'll be a schism. There'll be two sciences. Um, and they'll both be political, unfortunately. And sometimes you'll have to decide which paper you want to publish in one, one space or the other space. <laughs> the Republican journals are, you know, so I'll publish my mass paper over here. But my cancer drug policy, you know, those are very left of center ideas on regulation. I have to publish on the other journals. Um, I think we're, it's very bad. I don't, know, I don't know the path out of it. And then the last thing I want to pick your brain on is... The anxiety, um, you know, I think people underestimate how the pandemic affects their mood and their life. And I would just say, I think there's just some simple rules of thumb, which is like, how well do you sleep? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thankful I sleep, I sleep pretty good. Um, do you still exercise? I'm, I'm asking the listeners to like, they ask this about yourself. How, how well do you sleep? Do you still exercise? How do you eat? What, how's your weight been over the last few months? Um, when was the last time you hugged someone? When was the last time you kissed someone? When was the last time you, you felt love in your life? And if the answers to those questions are, you know, there's major differences in how you eat and how you sleep and how you exercise and you haven't hugged or touched anyone in many, many months, I think maybe you shouldn't be participating in policy dialogues. Like you're not in a good emotional place to do so. But I do think that many people are that way. They are really suffering. And yet the way in which you, their outlet for anxiety is pushing for more and more draconian restrictions and policy. Um, so I guess I'm curious your thoughts on 
what will COVID-19 mean in all this space kind of going forward? I, I think I will be wrong to make any prediction here. And uh, it, it's so complex and so convoluted, so multifactorial, so uh, interdigitated uh, with uh, society, economy, politics, uh, uh, value systems, uh, how we feel about our lives, what defines our lives, who we are, mm -hmm. who we want to be for single people, for communities, for countries, for uh, federal bundling or, or, you know, the whole globe. So it's, uh, it's going to be very difficult to make predictions. But obviously, you have a major perturbation of the system. And uh, before the pandemic, I, I was among the people who liked perturbations. So, you know, probably <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I had made a reputation of, mm -hmm. of being a maverick and perturbing mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, equilibria. Mm -hmm. But I, I felt that that was just too much of a perturbation for, for the global community to handle. And uh, uh, it was a major threat. The pandemic, the virus was a major threat, which meant that we should do everything in our capacity to reduce the other components of the perturbation. And I think we just did the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we threw more perturbation on something that was already a major threat. Mm -hmm. and, and now, who knows? I mean, you know, all of these dimensions that you mentioned that are very important are, are almost chaotic. You don't know. I mean, you know, riots and wars, how can you predict whether one day there will be one army crossing uh, one boundary? Maybe Imperial College London will make a model that helps you. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe they'll make a model. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. I mean, it's these chaotic events yeah. that I, I really worry the most. But worrying is not the right word because, as you mentioned, anxiety is something that we should avoid mm. as much as possible. Our life has been disrupted in major <clears throat> ways. We should try to find some psychological calm and, and some sense of belonging, some sense of... of of social cohesiveness and and also love you mm -hmm. mentioned love mm -hmm. you know just hugging people and and you know how often have you kissed someone in the last two yeah. years i mean these are important questions and yeah. these are nowhere in the scientific literature yeah. i don't know is there a paper how often uh, one has kissed <laughs> i'm people? sure somebody could survey and with it with <laughs> maybe a, there is with the 20 percent no and but you know five months ago you could have published in in a top journal but now the publishing <laughs> the publishing economy for COVID has plummeted so uh, so so, yeah. so we, we we need to to do our best to be tolerant of people, of their mistakes, to acknowledge mistakes. I, I think I know very little. I always felt that I knew next to nothing. During the pandemic, I have felt even worse in that regard. But this doesn't mean that I'm not struggling to learn more. <clears throat> but we need tolerance. We need tolerance of what other people think, what other people believe, what is their values, what is important for them. <clears throat> and allowing them to be free to express themselves. Some of them may be just crazy. So be it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. let, let them say what they believe, and then we will try to get evidence, data, rationalize, and, and um, arrive at what is best. But do allow people to feel that they're not losing their basic freedoms, because I, I think that this is what many people are are feeling at the moment. This is what has happened to many, many people. I couldn't agree more. That's really well said. You know, I think I think also about your question about science communication and how one might work on that. And I think that, you know, the model we lived with in the 20th century was that science is communicated through the public through a certain series of venues, including television news. That's how I was grown. I grew up on science. What I knew about science, I'd watch for seven minute segment. And it was often inspirational. That's what made you know, me interested in science, I think. That combined with you know, high school science classes. Now I think, I guess, I think that my personal view of it is the only way to make science really true to the public is to try to do what I'm trying to do with you and try to, you know, try, try to do like, to make transparent how we think about science as a process and, and, and having long dialogues. And I think you're also right though, that even with a long dialogue, it's still, you know, you don't get everything right. You don't put everything the way you want it. There can still be misunderstandings. But the more you talk about the science as you would to a scientist who supposedly has read the paper uh, and understands the paper, the more you make that transparent and visible um, in the media that people like to consume these days, which I guess is this pod podcast video, that's what that's where these kids are these days. Um, I think that's the best hope to try to actually reach people because I just don't think it's it's not possible to explain 
any even simple concepts on this three minute cable news segments. Um, you know, so your point about the experts on TV, they often lack scientific expertise. I just feel like, you know, even if they, if they had it, they might not be able to get it across. You know, that's the challenge. It's very difficult to communicate science within three minutes. I'm, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very difficult. And it, it can very easily be misinterpreted and just uh, <clears throat> chopped into small pieces uh, that then become narratives or serving narratives that have nothing to do with the original communication. Mm. So longer discussions, and especially discussions that allow people to see what is the reasoning and what, what are the nuances and what are the balancing forces, may be better. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's very difficult, even with this type of setting, but, but we have to do it because right now science is in the entire community and it's being tossed up and down. I don't want to think of, of political science splitting science into two uh, or more slices that that would be horrible uh, thinking of uh, what is the party allegiance of a journal before I submit there yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think that we need to defend science uh, we need to defend science for what it stands for for the ability to have healthy criticism for the ability to share for the ability to be following a universalism uh, approach and for the ability to have no conflicts of interest and and we have threats on all of these frontiers hmm. very heavy threats john thank you so much for doing this i really appreciate your time thank um, you Vinay. it's been a pleasure and um thanks for for continuing to work on all these issues and i think listeners should check out your many papers um on sars cov 2 over the last uh two years you've been quite busy and they're very interesting from the shielding index to your recent paper about vac uh, how you can infer vaccine efficacy from the ages in which vaccines were deployed that was an elegant work um they're ve they're 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 as clever as they ever were john yeah. thank you yeah. i'm sure that i still make tons of mistakes <laughs> <laughs> well we all do but uh thankfully they're not on 60 minutes so <laughs> it's not on, not on tv um thanks so much uh thanks so much for doing this a million thanks.